to the Erie Canal that inspired the birth of a necklace of communities called mill towns that became epicenters of invention and innovation, inspired a westward movement. That's what we can achieve here if we stay focused and we believe in reigniting the American dream. The reigniting of the American dream is going to depend upon, once again, those small businesses out there, the entrepreneurs that are willing to take the risks, that are willing to take their concept and their idea and put it into a business. Along the way, the history of America, as you well described it with the Erie Canal, we can look at all of the other great industrial advances that have been made, there's always been a partnership between the government and the uh, individual companies and entrepreneurs that are out there. For example, the oil industry has enjoyed for more than a century over $13 billion a year of tax subsidies to encourage the production of oil. And it was an incredibly successful partnership between the government, not only with tax subsidies, but making the public lands available for the uh, exploration and the extraction of oil. Uh, over the last hundred years, creating the wealthiest industry in the world. Now, once an industry has matured, as has the oil industry, we should remove those subsidies and use those subsidies for the new industries that we need. <clears throat> We've been discussing for the last, well, since Carter and the first oil embargo, the need for American energy security. Most people now believe that American energy security is, based, is going to be based upon the continuation of the oil industry and the coal industry at some level, using the natural gas that we now find that is more plentiful than we once thought as a bridge, let the oil and the uh, coal industries uh, wane while we build the renewable industry. And so if we took those tax subsidies that the oil and coal industry have enjoyed for a century, shifted them to the new industries, we could then see a blossoming of the green industries. In California today, the solar and wind and biofuel industry employs some 320,000 people. It's a growing sector of the American economy. And the policies that emanate from Washington, D.C. can either help or hinder that growth. That growth is not only new jobs here in the United States, but it's also energy independence. The sun shines on the United States. Well, not at night, but it does shine during the day in most parts of the United States. So solar, the wind blows. And I'm not just talking about the wind in this chamber, <coughs> but across the nation. <coughs> now, we have to couple that with public policies. And I want to speak to one specific policy, and that is shifting the subsidies that the oil industry has had for a century, shifting those subsidies over to the renewable side of it. And here again in the renewable side, this bill, H.R. 487, I happen to be the author. I'm kind of pleased with this piece of legislation. This bill would require that the subsidies be used to buy American-made solar and wind and other uh, renewable energy equipment. We should never use our tax dollars to buy a solar panel made in China. <coughs> we should never use our tax dollars to buy a wind turbine manufactured in Germany. If somebody wants to go out and buy a solar panel using their own money, buy whatever you want. But if it's our tax dollars, buy American. Use our tax dollars to buy American-made equipment. Use that to reignite the American dream, to build those machines, those solar panels in the United States. Use our tax money to buy American-made equipment, whether it's a bus, a train, a plane, or a solar panel or a wind turbine. These are public policies that emanate from this house. We can change what's going on in the American manufacturing sector. Mr. Tonko? Yeah, Representative Garamendi, as you toss out pieces of the puzzle there, um, it conjures up all sorts of uh, response that uh, I think we need to uh, provide and share. Uh, you talk about the intermittent nature of renewables, uh, sun not shining at night, wind ceasing to blow, um, you name it, uh, the water perhaps. Uh, 
the hydro facilities, perhaps if you have a dry season, whatever. We need to advance the, the notion of the battery as the linchpin uh, to move forward aggressively with a sustainable agenda which renewables can provide. And so the advanced battery manufacturing that I see taking hold in the 21st Congressional District in Schenectady with the GE operation. Excuse me, excuse me. Why do we keep coming back to the 21st Congressional District, Mr. Yeah, Tonko? It seems to be the one that I know the best. <laughs> so, um, but what I see happening there is, again, a great intellect being poured into design and uh, the concepts of advanced batteries. And not only can these batteries move heavy freight, heavy equipment, they can also deal with storage of renewable intermittent power. Once you do that, now you have solved the reliability issue, which is so important for our operations of energy. But to your point, not only is it sustainable and not only does it create energy independence, it speaks to our policies from a national security perspective. We are purchasing from some of the most troubled spots in the world. If we're not doing that at the moment, we inspire, we cause the world market to do that. And a cartel controls our destiny. Is that smart? We are sending hundreds of billions of dollars into treasuries of unfriendly nations that can then use that to train troops against our own American forces. So it speaks eventually and very directly to our national security issues. And beyond that, when you talk about job creation, when we go energy independent, when we become more resourceful, which we ought to pledge to, uh, to do, uh, simply because no matter how it's generated, whatever the mix of our supply of energy resources, we, we need to steward those resources in a very, very deliberate fashion, in a way that is resourceful and not wasteful. So we build alternative technologies. We build into a renewable market. We do the linchpin activity with the advanced battery uh, design and manufacturing, all in the U.S. And then we also provide for the training of the workforce. When we at NYSERDA had invested in our annual conference on workforce development, green collar job development, we had those, uh, in one seminar, we had the presentation of how they were training plumbers in, in Germany in a solar hot water uh, agenda where they were able to put together the training that enabled homes in a very aggressive fashion to use solar panels on their house simply for their hot water purposes. What that couldn't do for a state like California, a state like New York, and then in mass cumulatively for the nation is an incredible savings to our environment, to our job creation, uh, and to energy costs. Absolutely important. And households will do well, jobs will be created, the environment will be better addressed. And isn't that the goal of, of a think tank like the House of Representatives? Instead, why did we ignore manufacturing for a decade and a half? Why did we avoid dealing with agriculture? Why did we not get into sound energy policy? I ran for this seat simply driven primarily by the lack of a comprehensive energy plan for this nation. How can a nation as great as the United States, with all of its small business, all of its manufacturing, its industrial sector, its households demanding a better outcome for energy, how could we not develop a comprehensive energy plan? It's what the president has asked us to do. He has challenged us. He's challenged us with fairness in the tax code. He has challenged us in a way that will inspire the reigniting of the American dream, driven by that notion of small business support, entrepreneur uh, nurturing, and a thriving middle class. It's achievable, and what I would say, we have the format out there, we have the plan, we have work to do, let's move forward. There are so many pieces to this puzzle. You've talked about the research, you've talked about the support of new uh, businesses, particularly in the clean energy sector. Uh, as we discuss those things, I keep thinking about what is happening, I think very unfortunately, in this debate. It's a political year, and we've got our elections. We have the election of the President and the Senate. All of those things are up, 
And so we take issues and we may take a specific problem and drive that problem to the point of destroying other good programs that are underway. This is happening right now. The Solyndra case. Three times on the floor today I heard the, the word Solyndra come up. This was a problem. This was a company that was supported by a, ta by a, a, a loan guarantee and it failed. It largely failed because of China's policy of dumping, dumping onto the American market underpriced solar cells. That's why the company failed. Now, we have the opportunity to deal with this, but before I get to how we can deal with that China problem, I want to just ask my Republican colleagues to be very, very careful as they drive this political issue because they may succeed in making this a big political issue for this country, but by doing so, they may cause America to turn its attention away from renewable energy. The very issue you raised, Mr. Tonko, we have to have energy security, and renewable energy of all kinds is going to be part of that. So we must be very careful whatever political advantage there may be to the Solyndra case, be aware, America, that underlying this is an extremely important policy in the United States to achieve energy independence, to free ourselves from the slavery of the oil barons and dictators around the world so that we can have an energy, a secure energy system in the United States. It will, by necessity, involve renewable energy. Solyndra is a problem. Making it into a political problem, okay. But don't turn Americans' view and hopes away from the renewable, clean energy sector. It is vital. And we have to have policies in place to support that, just as we have supported the oil industry for more than a century. Put that same support behind the batteries that you talked about, Mr. Tonko. Put that same support behind the, the uh, biofuel industry. Put that same support behind the solar and wind. And also the smart grid. Right now in my district, Lawrence Livermore Labs is looking at developing a research program on how to integrate these um, <coughs> renewable and variable energy systems into the grid so that they all mesh and provide the energy that is needed by America as it changes hour by hour across the United States. A very, very important research project. All of these things come back to government policy and support. So we must be very careful about that. I do want to take up the China currency issue and the dumping of in this case, solar cells on the American market. Would you like to start that discussion, Mr. Well, you know, Just on the grid thing, I would like to make a comment because sometimes it's like we're challenged so that we can walk away from the challenge of the moment and it's not the best thing for us. In 2003, this nation witnessed the blackout from Ohio right through southern Canada into the great northeast, New England, New York, and some of the eastern seacoast, all driven by failure in the grid system. Now, never in that year that elapsed uh, was there much discussion about public policy. And that was a presidential year that, that befell the nation. And it just does not get talked up. Now, finally, historic amounts of investment through the Recovery Act were made in the grid system and challenging us to step it up, do what's required to use state-of-the-art opportunities for smart grid, smart thermostats, smart meters, enabling people to have more control, more destiny over their energy usage, over their energy bills, making certain that, again, we pour ourselves into an investment of, of a unique type, an historic investment that enables us to go forward with the sorts of responses that we need. We need the arteries and veins the transmission and distribution system to wheel the electrons to the workplace, the home place, as it's required. And in New York, again, in, in, in our bordering of Canada, if we want to import hydropower from another nation, and wheeling now, you know, we've moved well beyond the monopoly setting where you had regional 
um, situations. Now you wheel from region to region, state to state, nation to nation. We need upgrades in the system just to transport uh, the, uh, the electrons that are required. It's, it's not if we're going to do it, it's when we're going to do it. And the chance that we have right now is to move us forward in a way that strengthens this economy, cuts energy costs, provides for more wise use of those energy supplies, enables us to produce the energy ideas, if it's alternative technology or energy efficiency or what have you. But this nation is replete with a history of invention that has come through very thoughtful, uh, thoughtful application of what is needed out there by society. And for us to have walked away from those challenges is unacceptable. And that's what the grid is telling us right now. You know, you can lay back and say, hey, you don't need an upgraded train system. You don't need an upgraded grid system. You don't need broadband. You don't need all of this technology. You don't need the investment in R&D. Well, that complacency or the, the content uh, that people might feel, the contentment that people might feel with status quo, it will get us nowhere. In fact, it will push us farther behind as nations bulk up, invest, and stretch their opportunities simply by committing to a progressive agenda. And that's what we call for here to reignite the American dream. Well, that American dream is going to be held back by unfair trade policies that are seriously harming the American economy. Early on, I put this... Uh, Early on, I put this up. I don't know that you were here at the time. This is the American trade deficit. Much of this deficit is a deficit in trade with China. A lot of that deficit is caused by Chinese currency manipulation. The Chinese currency is undervalued somewhere around 20 to 25, maybe 27 percent, which gives their manufacturing sector a 20, 25 percent advantage because of the currency manipulation. A now, year Representative ago, Garamendi, would, yes, would you yield to yes, a point? Sir. I believe I saw earlier a chart that you had on manufacturing jobs. Yes. Could you just like put that one up on the easel over the over that right. pattern there and, and point to the to the ninety seven to to uh, two thousand nine curve and it's this one. Uh, a startling mimicking those two graphs absolutely mimic each other. And I think you can draw a correlation there that deals with the loss of manufacturing jobs as it relates to the trade deficit. And I think that is something that ought to guide our discussions, guide our policy development, and actually address the sort of response we need in terms of job creation, job retention. The, thank you. I, I, really hadn't noticed, but they're almost parallel. One is right on top of the other. You can put that blue line, and it copies the red line. That is the growth in the American trade deficit. I want to just deal with this China thing quickly. We only have another seven minutes here uh, before we uh, yield the floor. A year ago, this House, with both Republican and Democrat support, passed the China currency legislation that would require the Department of Commerce to put a countervailing tariff on imported Chinese goods if that, trade mani if that currency manipulation were to continue. It went over to the Senate. It did not pass the Senate. This year, I should say this session, in 2011, the Senate passed a similar bill that would impose a countervailing tariff on Chinese goods as long as China maintained its currency manipulation. Came over to the House nearly seven months ago. The Speaker and the Republicans have refused to take up that bill, the very same bill that a previous year we voted on bipartisan. This is an important piece of legislation because it would deal with this issue, two issues, the loss of American manufacturing jobs and the extraordinary trade deficit 
that is the export of American money to China. It is the policy behind many of the problems in the manufacturing sector. And it is policy changes that we have the power to put in place to reignite the American manufacturing sector, to rebuild it and simultaneously put in place the ladders of success, education, research, entrepreneurship, support of the small businesses, all of those things that actually does reignite the American dream. Mr. Tonko, why don't you take the last well, two minutes and then we can wrap up. Right. Well, what I hear here is that, um, you know, an election outcome uh, is more important than the outcome for the American worker. And when political party benefit trumps the American worker or trumps America's manufacturing base and trumps hope into the future, um, that's a regrettable outcome. And what we need to focus on is the big picture. And if there's upset and upheaval because we're coming back from what was a very long and deep and painful recession, if that's upsetting news to a political scene, then we have lost the spirit that is required right now to bring America back and to reignite the American dream. That reigniting of the American dream, I believe, is what people want to see in action. They keep asking Washington to work together in a bipartisan, bi uh, bicameral spirited way. Work in a way that will engage the policies and advocate for the resources that will build the hope back into the fabric of America's families, her individuals. And it's within our grasp. These ladders of success, these rungs of opportunity, um, they are a very achievable goal. We saw what happened when you ignore manufacturing. We saw what happened when you avoid sound agriculture policy. We saw what happened when you didn't get aggressive about a innovative agenda for energy generation, energy alternatives, energy efficiency. These are the things that people are asking us to do as leaders. They're saying, well, we asked you to lead, not to sit content with status quo, not to watch others pass us by, but our best days lie ahead of us. I'm filled with optimism about reigniting that American dream. I saw what happened. I saw what happened in my district when there was a commitment. And you know, the Erie Canal itself, that came about in response to tough economic times. And the leadership then said, let's do this. Let's wed the waters. Let's build a port on the coast out of New York. Let's wed it to the Great Lakes. Let's inspire progress. And look what happened. That response to troubling economic times drew upon the leadership. It produced the leadership. It gave it a face and it gave it a voice. And the message was, we're going to build. We're not going to cut our way to prosperity, cut our way to opportunity, cut hope. We're going to build hope. We're going to build and invest in America, her workers. Our best days lie ahead of us, Representative Garamendi, and thank you for the chance to well, join you this evening. Thank you, Mr. Tonko. I notice that we still have a minute. I see my Republican colleagues are going to take the floor in a few moments. And if I recall last week when they did this, they said the answer lies in doing away with regulations. But clearly, regulations are a piece of the issue. Were those regulations, those the same regulations we want to take away from Wall Street? Uh, I would hope that they don't want to eliminate the regulations that, uh, that we put in place to bring Wall Street under control. But regulations are a small part of the overall problem. There is a large number of other issues, some of which we've talked about today, others of which we will bring up as we discuss, for example, infrastructure, which will be our next piece. But those regulations that are in place today are there for the protection of key parts of the American economy. Worker safety, the pollution regulations so that our streams and rivers are not polluted, our air is not polluted, so there's not mercury and other carcinogens in the air. And that regulations dealing with the way in which business operates. Now, they can be modified, but be very, very careful if that is your only solution 
to the demise of the manufacturing sector because it is but a small part of the overall issue. We've discussed many of the other parts here today. We ought to be, all of us, Democrat and Republican, alike in dealing with the twin problems of the trade deficit and the extraordinary and disastrous loss of manufacturing jobs. This is where the American middle class lost it, when the American manufacturing sector declined. We can rebuild it with wise public policies. Wise public policies are what we ought to be doing, rebuilding the, manu the American manufacturing sector and reigniting the American dream as we do that. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Tonko and I yield back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is my privilege and honor to be recognized by you to address you on the floor of the House of Representatives. And it's also uh, my privilege to be here to listen to the presentation of the gentleman uh, from essentially the East Coast and the West Coast present their version of solutions uh, for the United States of America. And if I could just take that, uh, Mr. Speaker, and, and roll it backwards from uh, bottom to top rather than top to bottom, I hear the concern, and I share concerns, about the loss of American manufacturing and the loss of American trade and the trade deficit that we do have. And I hear the advice, which is, we should have wise public policies that we should advance going forward that would be good for American manufacturing, good for American trade, that would bring about the, the, the refurbishment and the renewal of American manufacturing and bring about a balance in trade and perhaps a, a surplus in exports, which is good for this country because we'd rather collect IOUs than issue IOUs. I agree with the gentleman on both of those points. And I suspect we don't agree on how to get there to those points, Mr. Speaker. But I would make this point that the United States has been a very strong industrial nation. In fact, in the, at the end of World War II, we were the only industrialized nation in the world that had a, an, an established global, a globally competitive industry that had not been devastated by the war. And... We had a surplus of exports because here in the United States we could produce things, we could make things, we could export them to the rest of the world. And we did. We did it with military supplies, we did it with all kinds of industrial supplies. The United States of America was the industrial powerhouse of the world. As much as the rest of the industry had been destroyed, and we had built ours up in that period of time in order to supply the global World War II war effort. So the United States' industry was the preeminent industry in the world. And why was it? Because of the reasons I've said. Plus, we were competitive. We had a wage and a salary and a benefit package that was competitive. We had American workers that were more productive than any other workers in the world. We had a well-educated workforce. We had a work ethic. We had a work ethic where we took great pride in being able to go to work. And if we punched the clock, we produced more per hour that we were out there on the floor of that factory than anybody else in the world because of a number of reasons. American ingenuity, American industriousness, industriousness and America's work ethic. We did those things and we set the standard for the world and that carried us beyond World War II through the 50s, through the 60s, through the 70s, into the 80s and actually into the 90s. And over a period of time, as the gentleman's charts show, America's industry began to lose its competitive advantage with the rest of the world and the rest of the world began to catch up. I saw the signs of that. I saw the signs of it in the 50s when we would get close to New Year's and here's, you know, just think of Japan. Japan devastated in World War II. A lot of their production facilities were in homes, not in factories. And they had factories too. And they were bombed and they were burned and they were destroyed. And the tragedy, all of that is a part of history that I, I don't care to uh, address here tonight, Mr. Speaker. But in the aftermath, they needed to start up something. They needed to produce goods and services that had a marketable value, both in Japan and abroad, and they did. And the things that showed up here were paper goods. Little things like when it came time to celebrate New Year's, there would be a, a little Japanese uh, whistle that would blow out the, like the tongue of the dragon and roll back up again. 
That way we got those paper products coming from Japan because that's what they could do. They could make them, they could produce them, they could sell them, they could make a little money selling those things to Americans. And that would be in the 50s. In the early 60s, what came along? Well, transistor radios. And there would be the Toshiba radio, Japanese made portable transistor radio that you could carry around with you out on the farm and listen to the radio. How about that? What an idea of an invention. I didn't mean that it was a Japanese idea. It was a Japanese produced idea that could compete with the American productions. And so they sold radios made in Japan into the United States. And a lot of young American kids carried those Toshiba radios around and other portable radios in order to listen to rock music of the time. They didn't have talk shows at that time. Not that I remember anyway. And so that slowly the Japanese began to ramp up their industry. They went from paper toys to radios to optical equipment. Some of the best optical equipment in the world was produced in Japan. Still is, for that matter. And so they made binoculars and cameras, and they created a culture of people that love their cameras, and they evaluate those cameras made in Japan and how they, how they compete with the rest of the world. And if you watch the Japanese tourists, they're here using their cameras on a regular basis. Now, of all the way they've ramped up to be able to compete with the rest of the world, here we sat in the United States thinking that somehow or another this wave that we had caught would forever carry us. And our industry slowly began to atrophy, slowly began to lose its competitiveness. And it reminds me of a study that was done uh, by a Russian economist who was commissioned by, by Lenin back in the uh, second decade of the 20th century. When, uh, when Lenin decided that he wanted to find an economist that would prove that capitalism would eventually expire, that it was a self-defeating economy. So he hired an economist or ordered him to produce a product, and his name was Koltiev. Well, the economist Koltiev, let's see, K-O-L-T-I-E-V, is how I remember it being spelled, that's for you. And, uh, but but uh, Koltiev's theory was... Uh, he picked to put together the theory that Lenin had directed him to produce, which is that capitalism would expire, that it was self-defeating, that even though it might have brief bursts of success, eventually that it would wear out of, run out of energy, and it would expire and diminish, and essentially that would be the end of the wave of capitalism. So Koltiev sat down and he charted the free enterprise economy, going clear back to the 18th century and earlier, and he tracked unemployment, gross domestic product, uh, the, the output of the nations, and followed the industries. And uh, so he, and when he tracked this cycle of capitalism in the effort to prove his charge that had come from Lenin, it was this, uh, that yes, capitalism does decline, that the capital investment and the unemployment and the GDP of the countries that have free enterprise economies does diminish, in a, in a, but it diminishes down to a point where it regenerates itself again. And when looked at, and this was a study that was back in the dusty volumes at MIT University and much forgotten about until there was a computer study that was done. And somebody remembered that they had read the Red Koltiev study that was back in the annals at MIT. Now, they went back and dusted it off and compared it to the modern computer analysis, which now is a generation old. And they concluded that the computer analysis of the cycles of capitalism matched that of Koltiev, whose theory was this, that we have a 52-year cycle. Now, I don't stand on that it's 52 years or 75 or 25 or any year other than that, but the theory that he uses to explain his 52-year cycle is instructive to all of us. And that's this, that when you hit the bottom economically, when your GDP has bottomed out, when your unemployment rate is at the top and when your capital investment is at the bottom, you look around as a society, a culture, and an economy, and you, and you think, we have to do something. What are we going to do? And the psychology of that is that all of us sitting at the bottom of the economic cycle with high unemployment, low GDP, and low capital investment, we see that if we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we're going to end up with the same result. And we don't like where we are. We don't want to be where we are in four or five or 10 or 20 years or a generation or two. So what will we do that's different? And I've lived through this uh, time or two, especially during the farm crisis years of the 80s, 
when I saw that land values were spiraling downwards to perhaps as low as a third of what they were just a few years before. Market prices going downwards the same way. We rely on rain. It couldn't rain. The markets uh, didn't produce a value for the crops that could be raised, and the land values went down. Everything was spiraling downwards. But what was going on was the manifestation of Koltyev's theory was springing up. And people who had no immediate hope economically began to put together a strategy for the long term so that we would have a successful economy. And it, and it matched almost perfectly with Koltyev's theory, the Russian economist's theory, which is that when your economic cycle reaches the bottom and everything is sitting down here with a low capital investment, high unemployment, low GDP, people are looking for a way to solve that, those problems. So their creativity kicks in. And they began to think and talk and dream and pray about what kind of ideas can come to fruition to reverse the cycle, the downward cycle that they are in. And so they began to come up with new inventions and they come up with new efficiencies. They come up with new business models. And as these ideas are generated, the ideas have to catch the kind of energy that can attract capital. Now, there's not as much capital in a low economy as there is a high economy, but there's much more demand for it. And, and so you go out with your ideas and you market them and you attract the capital to generate these ideas. This is what we did during the, when they, when, at the beginning of the dot-com bubble. If you remember that we learned here the creativity of a bad economic cycle was a contributing factor to developing the microchip and the ability to store and transfer information more effectively and more efficiently than ever before. And thus was born the dot-com bubble, the creation of the boom of the dot-com. And that was once investors saw that ability to store and transfer information more effectively, more efficiently than ever before, they began to invest in it because they believed that transferring that information, storing and transferring it, turned into a profit share. So they invested their capital and the profit share began to get injected into the dot-com and the dot-com bubble was born. Now the mistake with the dot-com bubble was just an adjustment in investment. But what really happened was there was an over-exuberance in investment during the dot-com bubble years. And uh, that was uh, the years that the middle of the 90s were the beneficiaries of. The over-exuberance in investments reflected the understanding of the investment community, the attraction of capital to these dot-com ideas, the, these creative ideas to store and transfer information more efficiently than ever before. The, the creativeness of that um, was not regulated by this realization that storing and transferring information didn't necessarily translate into profit, that it had to create any efficiencies in order to be translated into profit. So we had an over-exuberance in investment. The dot-com bubble began to swell. And when under the Clinton administration, the Justice Department filed a lawsuit against Microsoft, that was the lance that pierced the dot-com bubble. The dot-com bubble collapsed. But the growth that came was the growth that came from the understanding that we had created an ability to be more efficient than ever before, and the adjustments were in the aftermath. Well, that fits exactly within Koltyev's theory. We had hit the bottom economically. The creative people were looking around for something that they could do to change that paradigm. And what they came up with was the microchip and the other tools of software that allowed us to store and transfer information more efficiently than ever before. And being able to do that caused people to invest more, start new businesses, to transfer efficiencies around the country, and to, in to increase our efficiencies. If you think, for example, just in the trucking industry, the software packages that would, that would allow truck dispatchers to click the mouse rather than make a, a judgment decision and send a truck to Portland that you could drop a load off there and go to Seattle and circle back through uh, Montana and drop off a load and come back to the warehouse in, say, Des Moines, for example. Much more efficiencies were created by software packages that made much more efficiencies were created by software packages that made the decisions instead of fallible mortals that were using judgment calls while they were under stress on the fly. All of those things fit back to Koltyev's theory. 
is theory that during hard economic times, you would generate ideas. Some of those would be good ideas. The good ideas would attract capital. The capital would be invested. The invested capital would bring about new technology. The new technology would bring about increased efficiencies, increased efficiencies, increased productivity, increased productivity, increase the GDP, the gross domestic product, increased GDP. Of course, was good for the wealth of the nation. And once you reach the apex of the growth in the GDP, you ended up with a sense of success, a success of complacency. We have arrived, we've invested our capital, we've invented our new methods to produce more goods and services more efficiently than ever before. And we've translated that into profits and now let's just keep this ball rolling down the road. Well, as you keep the ball rolling down the road, you don't realize it at the time, but the complacency of the continued day-to-day -day excess the day-to-day -day success brings about that idea of, well, let's just hold on. Let's not create new. Let's just ride this out. And societies, economies, cultures ride out the successes. And when they ride out the successes, eventually, if competition doesn't catch you first from a foreign country, eventually those successes are riding on the capital investment of decades gone by and the efficiencies diminish in proportion to the depreciation of those capital investments and also in proportion to the creativity of the competing economies. And when that happens, you don't know it, but you're going downhill. I think of a poster that I saw in a friend of mine's house um, years and years ago. And it's a picture of a little boy sitting on a tricycle and he has his hands on the handlebars and his feet up off the pedals and he's got a big grin on his face and his hair is blowing back behind his head and underneath the poster underneath the, the poster picture it says if you're coasting you're going downhill well mr speaker there are many economies in the world throughout history that have reached the apex of their growth and they have decided they like where they are they get complacent and they begin to coast and if they're coasting, they're going downhill. Well, each economy, each society, each culture gets to that point where they start to coast and they go downhill. And the societies and the cultures that see it a different way, that understand that you have to constantly be innovating, you have to constantly be creating, you have to constantly find a way to be more competitive, they're the ones that show up in the Super Bowl of the global economy. And so when I listen to my colleagues from the East Coast and the West Coast, talk about what's wrong and what we need to fix and we need manufacturing jobs and that, that we've exported these jobs overseas, I would say to them, but you've been advocates for the policies that are protectionism. You've tried to protect the union jobs in the United States. You've opposed the free trade agreements that we've negotiated with foreign countries, including South Korea and Panama and Colombia, and you've insisted that well, it just be the voices of the unions that you represent have insisted that we have trade protectionism and that, that uh, the working conditions and the jobs and the benefits package that are negotiated in places like Colombia or South Korea be similar to those that are negotiated here in the United States. Mr. Speaker, we can't change the policy in South Korea. We can't change it in Colombia. We can't change it in Panama. And we can't change it in places like China or other places in the world. They are who they are, and they will compete within the limits of their ability to produce. And if we have policies that diminish our ability to compete, then we're going to have a lower market share and no amount of Congress posturing itself for the people that write campaign checks is going to change that competitiveness. We've got to be competitive. And so what would I advocate, Mr. Speaker? What is my solution for this? And I could go down through the list, you know, they talked about the American dream, and they talked about trade agreements, and they talked about manufacturing jobs and exporting our jobs overseas, and the export of American manufacturing to China. They talked about trade protectionism, and they want to reignite the American dream. Reignite it. Well, so do I, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to think that it still burns. And it burns based upon American liberty, American freedom. American opportunity. And what makes this country great? The 
wonderful discussion to have between Democrats and Republicans here. Mr. Speaker of the United States Congress, we seldom have any discussion like that. What makes this country great? What are the underpinnings that has grown this country into the unchallenged greatest nation in the world? And yes, we have our contemporary troubles. We remain the unchallenged greatest nation in the world economically, culturally, militarily, politically. We're the unchallenged greatest nation in the world. And why? I would challenge my colleagues to embellish the things I'm about to say. But I would say this. We have God-given rights, God-given liberty, and this is not a manifestation of Steve King in the modern world in 2012 telling you something right now, Mr. Speaker. This was a deep conviction of the American founders that we have rights that come directly from God. We get our rights from God. We don't, we don't get them from man. We don't get them from government. If government gives us rights, then who are we if government decides to take our rights away? Who, who are we to complain? They're the all-powerful, they're the omnipotent, the government. But our rights come from God, and our founding fathers all knew it, and they signed off on the Declaration of Independence. We're endowed by our creators with certain unalienable rights. These are the rights that are the foundation of American vigor. And if you think about the breadth of what this means, you know, America has received immigrants from donor nations all over the world. I believe every nation in the world and why do they come here? Because they're inspired by the American dream. The image of the Statue of Liberty, not necessarily the inscription, but the image of the Statue of Liberty. It says, all of you who come here legally into the United States have an opportunity to access the American dream. And when you access the American dream, you have an obligation to leave this country and this world a better place than it was when you came. And into that bargain is this, God-given rights. The only country in the world, in the history of the world, that's been founded upon that principle. Now, others might aspire to it. Others might look across the ocean here to the United States and aspire to God-given liberty. But this is the only nation in the world that's founded upon it. And the beacon that comes out of the Statue of Liberty, the beacon of that liberty itself is what attracts people here to the United States. And when they get on that ship or on that plane <coughs> or, excuse me, or whatever their method of transportation is to legally come into the United States, they come for the dream. They're attracted by the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of press, the right to keep and bear arms, the protection against double jeopardy, to be tried by a jury of your peers, to have property rights, a state's rights component of this that devolves these powers down to the states so each state can be a laboratory and the federal government is to be a, a hands-off minimalist government, not an all-powerful uh, all omnipotent government. And so, Mr. Speaker, that vision, that attraction, that magnetism of American liberty brings people from all over the world here into the United States. And who does it bring? Well, we have the visa lottery, all right. And even that, it gets a better cross-section of the global humanity than you would have if you just went out and you did a random selection of six-plus billion people on the planet and brought 50,000 in under the visa lottery. At least those that sign up for the visa lottery have a dream. They want to come to America, and 50,000 a year get lucky and cash in on the visa lottery. Now, I think it's a bad policy and you add the visa lottery to the family reunification plan and a number of other plans that we have, and anywhere between 93 and 89 percent of the legal immigrants in America are not measured by their merit, not measured by their ability to contribute to the United States. They're measured just simply by their ability, their desire to come here if they have a family member to come and join or if they got lucky in the visa lottery or if they happen to receive asylum as directed by the Secretary of State or some other method. But we only have between 7 and 11 percent of legal American immigration where we actually set the criteria here in this country. And you know the Constitution says that our job is to, the Congress has an authority to establish a uniform form of immigration. Well, uniform to me would mean a standard for everybody that comes into the United States, and I would set that policy 
to reward those people that could most contribute to the United States of America. Why wouldn't you have an immigration policy designed to enhance the economic, social, and cultural well-being of the United States? Excuse me. That's the logic and the rationale that we had when the Constitution was drafted and when it was ratified. It should be our logic and our rationale today, Mr. Speaker. But what's good? And there are many good things about our immigration policy, but what's good in particular is that it has attracted the cream of the crop of every donor civilization on the planet. Every country that contributed immigrants to the United States has sent us they're dreamers, they're doers, they're workers. Those people that wanted to access the American liberty and develop out the American dream. Excuse me. <coughs> and so when you think about America not being an appendage of England or Scotland or Ireland or Italy, or Ethiopia, or Colombia, or any other nation on the planet. We're not an appendage of that. We're the country that has set up the filter, that screened out those also-rans, those people that had only a mediocre dream, and let through that filter the people that had the exceptional dream, the dream that gave them an exceptional energy, an exceptional vision, an exceptional desire to come here and add to American exceptionalism. And American exceptionalism is built upon those liberties, those rights, freedom of speech, religion, the press, keeping bare arms, protection for double jeopardy, property rights, states' rights, the list goes on, tried by a jury of your peers, all of those things. And free enterprise capitalism, an essential component. And if you want to be naturalized into the United States and you want to study the naturalization for the naturalization test, the flash, the flash cards, uh, the glossy flash cards put out by CIS, Citizenship Immigration Services, that you can use to study to become a naturalized American citizen. They have these little flash cards, and you look at them, and on one side it'll say a question such as, who's the father of our country? Snap it over, and it says, we all know the answer, Mr. Speaker, George Washington. Then I uh, pick up the next card, and it might say, who emancipated, emancipated the slaves? Snap it over. Abraham Lincoln. Next card. What is the economic system of the United States of America? The president might have flunked this, but the answer is, snap it over, free enterprise capitalism. Those are principles that give us American vigor. And when you look at the American vigor and the component of that, and the, and the American vigor that comes from a filter, the filter of the difficulty of legally coming into the United States that skimmed the also-rans out and skimmed the, uh, the global vigor in and redirected them into the United States. We have this thing. The dreamers came to America. The doers came to America. We are an American vigorous civilization and society of people who came here because they wanted more opportunity than they had in the country that they left. There was only one place they could go that has the opportunity uh, that matches that, and it's the United States of America. They came here to do, and they did. They came for religious freedom. They came to raise their families. They came to leave this country a better place than it was, and they succeeded in all of that. And, Mr. Speaker, the United States of America is the unchallenged greatest nation in the world because of the fundamental principles, the fundamental rights, the fundamental American liberty, that exercised by dreamers and doers who stood on principle, who came here for religious freedom, for economic freedom, for property rights, for all of the things that are listed and laid out in the Bill of Rights, and they were not just a mediocre cross-section of the global population. They were the dreamers, the doers, the vigor of the planet came to the United States of America, and this vigorous American character, culture, and personality is unsuitable for the nanny state. It's unsuitable for the nanny state. The nanny state cannot be used and should not be used to oppress a free people, a people of vigor, a people of personality, a people of can-do spirit. And yet, here we are. What happened in the last Congress, the ruling Troika imposed upon us Dodd-Frank, Obamacare, they tried to impose upon us cap and tax, all of them 
should be rejected by a vigorous American people who will regulate themselves, who will con moderate and control themselves, who will set their own moral standards and need to have those standards be implemented and enforced at the closest level to the people as possible. That's the cities, the counties, and the states, not the federal government, Mr. Speaker. And so I think it's important for us to realize and recognize the American people are a unique race of people. We are not like anyone else on the planet. We may not look like anyone else, but underneath whatever those looks might be of your idea of what a cross-section of Americans are is an American vigor, an American personality, American culture, a common sense of history, a can-do spirit, people that are members of the society and the culture and the civilization of the unchallenged greatest nation in the world, and we derive our strength from free enterprise capitalism, Judeo-Christianity, Western civilization. That's the core of America, the vigor of America, and that's what we must continue to protect, regrow, and refurbish. And Mr. Speaker, I'm aware that the clock is winding down, and whether there is another speaker that's about to arrive, I have more in me, but I would pause for a moment to receive my instruction from the speaker. The gentleman has 30 seconds remaining. In which case, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I would recap this with my, my gratitude to the American people that, um, you know, that, that we are here, we are, we are putting a mark in place for posterity. And posterity watches us today. They're inspired and they are uh, they're informed by the actions of this Congress and the actions of the President. And as I, as I watch what unfolds here and the continuing growth in the dependency, the growth in the regulatory class in society, and I think about the growth of the, of the nanny state, and uh, the nanny state that uh, seems to think that it can be the protectorate for all of us, that somehow we can't make decisions for ourselves and for our well-being, Mr. Speaker. Yes, we can. Yep to quote the president, but not in any foreign language like si se puede. Gentleman's time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate your attention and the opportunity to address you here on the floor of the House of Representatives. Okay. Under the speaker's announced policy of January 5, 2011, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Bartlett, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oil is about $100 a barrel. We're in a recession. The United States uh, just a couple of years ago used 22 million barrels of oil to a day. Now we're using less than 19 million barrels of oil a day and still oil is $100 a barrel in the middle of a recession. We're also producing more oil in our country than we did last year for the first time since 1970. The production of oil has increased this last year. Every year before that, the production of oil was lower than it was the preceding year. And now with the Bakken oil, we're producing a bit more than we did last year. So why with increased oil production, decreased oil use in the middle of a recession, should oil still be $100 a barrel? This is uh, really hurting our economy. It increases the cost of uh, just about everything we use. Because if you've got it, a truck probably brought it. And the increased fuel cost increased the cost of just about everything, therefore, that we have. I believe the most important uh, speech given the last century was given in 1900 and 56, on the 8th day of March in San Antonio, Texas, by an oil geologist known as M. King Hubbard. We need to put his speech in context. 
At that time, the United States was king of oil. We produced more oil. We used more oil. We exported more oil than any other country in the world. On this uh, eighth day of March in 1956, M. King Hubbard made a, an astounding prediction. He said that in just 14 years, the United States would reach its maximum oil production. He wasn't sure what that number would be, but he made the prediction that we would reach our maximum production in 1970, just 14 years later, and no matter what we did, it would continue to go down after that. And from 1970 until about a year or so ago, that was true. Here I have a uh, chart that shows what has happened to uh, oil production in our country. A whole lot of it comes from Texas, as you can see from the lower dark blue below, and the rest of the United States, the lighter blue above. The uh, kind of orange here is natural gas liquids. That's not in your gas tank. That's propane and butane and chemicals like that. M. King Hubbard predicted uh, using only the uh, contiguous 48. He didn't include uh, Alaska, and he didn't include the Gulf of Mexico in his predictions. He made that prediction in 1956, about here. In 1970, as you can see here, we reached our maximum production in the lower 48, and it went down pretty consistently after that. Then we found oil in Alaska, a lot of it. And there was a little blip on the way down when you add that to the oil from the rest of the United States and Texas. And then a little later, there was the fabled uh, discoveries of oil in the Gulf of Mexico, and you can see what that did, just uh, can hardly see the blip there. A lot of oil, but we use a lot of oil. The world uses a billion barrels of oil every 12 days. It's pretty simple arithmetic. 84 million barrels a day by about 12, that's a thousand and million, and that's a billion barrels of oil in every 12 uh, days. Here is a, uh, oh, by the way, the M. King Hubbard that predicted that the United States was going to peak in 1970. Of course, he became a legend in his own time because he lived well beyond that. And he was exactly right, relegated to the lunatic fringe for maybe 15 years or so. He became a celebrity after his predictions came true. And he predicted that uh, what happened to the United States had to happen to the world. Oil is finite. One day it will run out. One day we will reach our maximum production, after which it will tail off after that in the world, just as it did in the United States. Now, if you think that collectively the world is brighter and cleverer and so forth than the United States, then you might think that that won't happen. But I think that we are the most creative, innovative society in the world. And if we couldn't turn it around, I think it's unlikely the world is going to turn it around. Well, here is a chart from just a few years ago. Peak oil, this uh, plateau, the maximum production is called peak oil. And uh, the question was asked, uh, are we there yet? Because you see, in, uh, this, these curves had flattened out. These are from the two entities that um, do the best job of uh, cataloging the production and use of oil. The EIA and the IEA, it's the same three letters of the alphabet, uh, turned a bit. One is a creature of the OECD, and the other is a part of our Department of, uh, of, of Energy. And they both, as you see, had uh, a plateau here. And look what happened to the price of oil. Now, this was a little bit before it peaked at $147 a barrel, and the economy collapsed along with the housing market. And that was kind of a uh, double whammy. It was both the housing market and the price of oil, $147 a barrel oil, and the economy came tumbling down, and 
Oil dropped to something under $40 a barrel and has steadily climbed since then up to now around $100 a barrel where it's been for uh, several months now. Are we there yet? Well, just recently we've had uh, two charts produced by one of those entities, the uh, IEA, the International Energy Association. And this is called the World Oil, the, the uh, World Energy Outlook. The chart on top here is from 2008, and the one on the bottom is 2010. Now, if you look at their website, you're going to have trouble finding the chart from 2008. They have purged their website of that uh, chart. And in a few moments, you'll understand why they purged it. Let's look at that chart. This dark blue is conventional oil. That's what we looked at before in the production of the United States. And it's been going up now for a uh, very long time. If you started back here 150 years ago, it would be at zero, and then we pumped more and more and more. And now the total liquids, not all of it, oil, some of it natural gas liquids, are up to about 84 million barrels of oil a day. Now, they are predicting just exactly what M. King Hubbard predicted, and that is that there would be a peak, and after that peak, it would fall off, and you see they are predicting a fairly dramatic fall off in the production of oil from the uh, fields that we are now uh, exploiting. But predicting out to 2030, they believe that by then we will have a total liquid fuels production of about 106 million barrels of oil a day. That will be made up of increasing amounts of natural gas liquids, and that will happen. We've found a lot of natural uh, gas, and uh, so those will increase. The uh, green here is non-conventional oil. That's going to also increase. That's oil like the um, tar sands of Alberta, Canada, that won't flow. You have to uh, lift it with a 100-ton shovel and put it in a truck that hauls 400 tons, and then you cook it for what we call stranded natural gas. That's natural gas where there aren't very many people to use it, so it's kind of stranded, and so its price is less. So you can afford to cook this oil with it. And that's going to grow, too, some. And then they make... Uh, two predictions here that this light blue is production from fields that we found but are too difficult to develop. Like a field found in the uh, Gulf of Mexico under 7,000 feet of water and uh, 30,000 feet of rock. I heard a number, I have no idea how you get this precise, but it was said that when oil was $111 a barrel, they could afford to develop this uh, field. So this is projected production from fields that we have found but are, with the current price of oil, too difficult to develop, uneconomically feasible to develop. And then the uh, bright red here are fields yet to be discovered. The uh, dark red here really belongs as a part of the uh, oil down here. It's a little bit of additional conventional oil we've gotten by what we called enhanced oil recovery. That's pumping some live steam down there or pumping some CO2 down there or in Saudi Arabia pushing some seawater down there. And some of their wells are now are producing seven times as much seawater as oil, but it's okay because they can separate the seawater from the, from the oil. Okay, two things about this um, uh, chart. Note the... Uh, fall off in production from conventional fields. And note that by 2030, 106 million barrels of oil a day projected that's what the world is going to be uh, producing. Just two years later, in 2010, reality is setting in. That's the lower chart down here. Reality is setting in. Now they're up by 35, five years later, now they're up to only... only uh, 96 million barrels of oil a day, not 106 million barrels of oil a day. And this is five years later when it really should have been higher. These top two um, curves here have been reversed and the color's different, but they're exactly the same thing. This is unconventional oil and this is natural gas liquids. Notice a precipitous decline 
in production from our current fields. And this includes, by the way, the enhanced oil recovery. You see it is in this chart, but it doesn't exist in this one because they've now incorporated and included where it belongs, and that is a part of the conventional fields that we're now pumping from. And here they show two huge wedges to keep this production going up slightly. They show two huge wedges here. Notice, considerably bigger they are, are they than the ones they projected just two years earlier. I don't think that these two wedges are going to occur. They did not occur in the United States. Now today we have technologies that we didn't have there, like horizontal drilling and fracking. So we can get more out of a field now than we could then, and we're going to go down and get some more oil out of fields that we thought were exhausted with this new technology. When you find a field that produces 10 billion barrels of oil, that is a big field. We've not found very many fields that produce 10 billion barrels of oil. That will last the world 120 days. Every 12 days, we use a billion barrels of oil. Now I think you can see why you can no longer find this projection they made in 2008 in their website, because it is just not consistent with the reality that they are forced to use in projecting here in just last year, 2010. I will be enormously surprised if these two wedges occur. There's little evidence that they should occur. They did not occur in our country. Unless you think the world is incredibly more capable than the United States, then you'll have some doubts as to whether those two wedges will occur or not. If they don't, this top curve is going to tip over for the world just exactly the way it did for the United States. We're not running out of oil. Many people who are disparaging, people who talk about peak oil would say, say that the peak oil people say we're running out of oil. We are not running out of oil. There is a lot of oil out there. There is more oil out there, more oil out there to be pumped than all the oil that we have pumped in the last 150 years. What we're running out of is our ability to pump that oil as fast as we would like to use it. This next chart is an interesting one. And it kind of puts what we're talking about in uh, perspective. The world according to oil. This is what the uh, world would look like if the size of the country was relative to how much oil reserves it had. You see here that Saudi Arabia kind of dominates the planet. They do. For oil reserves, they have, we believe, maybe about 22% uh, of all the reserves in all the world. Now, we aren't quite sure of that because a Wikipedia leak here a few months ago indicated that they may have 40% less oil than they've said. Let me explain what happened back when uh, OPEC could produce more oil than the world needed and an increased production would drive down prices. So they had an agreement in the OPEC nations that you could pump a certain percentage of your reserves. So if you were a country that needed some more revenue, you simply had more reserves. And without finding any new oil, you can look back through history and see that some of them magically had maybe twice the reserves that they had. They didn't find any new fields. They just said they had twice the reserves in the field that they already had. Then you see they could pump more oil. None of these OPEC nations <coughs> will let our technical people in to look at their records, so we really do not know how much oil they have. But we believe that it's relatively like this. You see little Kuwait looms huge on the world scene in terms of how much oil they have. Iraq, Iran, <coughs> huge amounts of oil. Venezuela really dominates our hemisphere, doesn't it? It's bigger than all of the rest of the countries put together in terms of oil reserves. And here we are, the United States, 
We have 2% of the reserves of oil in the world, and we use 25% of the world's oil, a little less now because our cars get a little better mileage and our economy is down a little, so we're using a little less, but roughly 25% of the world's oil. Our number one importer is Canada. They have less oil than we, but they don't have very many people up there to use it, so they can export it to us. Until a couple of years ago, our number two importer of oil was Mexico. And they also have less than us. Now, they have a lot of people, but their people are too poor to use the oil, so they can export it. But just a few years ago, the second largest oil field in the world, the Cantarell oil field in Mexico, started in rapid decline, declining as much as 20% a year in production. So now Mexico is our number three importer, and Saudi Arabia is now our number two. Mexico has been displaced by Saudi Arabia. Look at China and India over there. Tiny. China with a billion, 300 million people, with India well over a billion people, with an economy in China that's growing, well, in a recession. They've slumped now. They were 16% growth. Now I think there's something like 8% growth, and India's not far behind them. With a static oil production of 84 million barrels a day, and China last year used 6% more oil than it did a year before, where is it coming from? We use less. We used to be 22 million barrels a day. Now we're less than 19 million barrels a day, and some of the poorer countries of the world just can't afford the oil. So they are doing without. This disparity between the people who are using the oil and the people who have the oil are going to set up some huge geopolitical tensions in the world. China last year uh, sold more cars than we sold, and that curve is accelerating. China is now the number one polluter in the world. They just passed us. China is buying up oil all over the world. I wonder why. We have only 2% of the oil in the world, and we use 25% of the oil in the world, and we're not buying oil anywhere. We don't need to, because all you need to do is go to the global oil auction and have enough money and be the high bidder or participate at the bid price, and you get all the oil that you need if there's enough to meet everybody's needs. So why is China buying oil? The Dutch aren't buying oil, they're buying goodwill. You need a hospital, soccer field, roads. Simultaneous with uh, buying oil reserves all over the world, China's also aggressively building a blue water navy. They soon will have uh, more ships than we. They aren't our ships yet by a long shot. But this year they will graduate seven times as many engineers as we graduate. And about half of our engineering students are Chinese mostly and some uh, Indian students. We can't for long have that disparity between the graduates of engineers in our two countries and we continue to be the world's premier economic and military power. We have got to do something to capture the imagination of our people and encourage our young people to go into careers of science, math, and engineering. Let me tell you what I think may happen. I hope it doesn't. Why would China buy oil? Well, they're simultaneously very aggressively building a blue water navy and building capabilities for denial. There is now, and look it up, a uh, Chinese anti-ship missile that uh, we essentially have no defense against. It travels 1,200 miles. There's no reason they can't put it on a ship, which means you couldn't get within 1,200 miles of a Chinese ship that had this missile on it unless we developed some defense against that uh, missile. Let's hope the time does not come when China says, hey, guys, I'm sorry but we have a billion, 300 million people. We have 900 million people in rural areas that through the miracle of communications know the benefits of an industrialized society, and they're saying, hey, guys, what about us? And our empire may unravel if we don't meet the needs of those people, so we can't share our oil. It's ours. We bought it. 
we can't share it. We've got to have it. That would plunge the rest of the world into a recession, and China then would have to look to their population as consumers for the goods that they uh, produce. And a billion, 300 million people could be a pretty big consuming population. The uh, tragedy is that your government has paid for uh, four different studies. Two of them uh, issuing in uh, 05 and two of them in 07 that said the same thing. The peaking of oil is either present or imminent with potentially devastating consequences. Your government chose to ignore those four studies because it was not politically expedient to admit that we had a problem of those proportions. Now, we should have known that those predictions were coming because a very wise man in what I think was the most insightful speech of the last century, if M. King Hubbard gave the most important speech, I think that Hyman Rickover, the father of our nuclear submarine, gave the most insightful speech just about a year later. I don't know if these two men knew each other. But on the um, 15th day of May in 1957, to a group of physicians in St. Paul, Minnesota, Hyman Rickover gave a speech that was lost until a few years ago, and now you can find it on the Internet. Just Google for Rickover and energy speech, and it will come up. He said some things there that should have been self-evident, and everybody should have been saying it, but it took Hyman Rickover to say the obvious. There is nothing man can do to rebuild exhausted fossil fuel reserves. They are finite. The moon is not made out of green cheese. The earth is not made out of oil. One day it will be gone. They were created by solar energy 500 million years ago and took eons to grow to their present volume. In the face of the basic fact that fossil fuel reserves are finite, the exact length of time these reserves will last is important in only one respect. The longer they last, the more time do we have to invent ways of living off renewable, you've heard of renewable energy, or substitute energy sources and to adjust our economy to the vast changes that we can expect from such a shift. Have you noticed we've been doing that? I haven't. I love this last quote here because I think it pretty well describes where we are and what we're doing. Fossil fuels resemble capital in the bank. A prudent and responsible parent will use his capital sparingly in order to pass on to his children as much as possible of his inheritance. A selfish and irresponsible parent will squander it in riotous living and care not one whit how his offspring will fare. Drill, baby drill. And the unspoken part of that mantra is, and to hell with our kids and our grandkids, let them shift for themselves. I remember when the vice president came and asked me if I would vote to drill in Anwar, and I said, I will be happy to do that. When you commit, this was Dick Cheney, that you're going to use all the revenues you get from Anwar to invest in alternatives, because we're way late in doing what Hyman Rickover said we needed to do in 1957, I noted that we were going to live our kids, leave our kids a huge debt. It's bigger now than I thought it would be then. And I said, wouldn't it be nice to leave them? a little oil. Here is a quote from uh, one of those studies. This was the first and the biggest of those studies, the uh, so-called Hirsch Report, SAIC, big study. World oil peaking is going to happen. World production of conventional oil will reach a maximum and decline thereafter. That maximum is called the peak. A number of competent forecasters project peaking within a decade. It has happened. Others contend it will occur later. Prediction of the peaking is extremely difficult, he says. Oil peaking presents a unique challenge. The world has never faced a problem like this, an unprecedented problem that the world faces. I have a last chart here that I think kind of helps us to put this in perspective. And this <laughs> shows the production of oil, and this chart's a few years old, we need to have it updated. But this is when oil was discovered, way back in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. This is the use of oil. By the way, tonight when you do your prayers, thank the um, Islamic world for the uh, 
oil price spike hikes of the 70s. Look what it did. It woke us up. If they hadn't awakened us, and this curve continued, it would be through the top of the chart by now. Up until the Carter years, it was a stunning statistic. Every 10 years, we used as much oil as had been used in all of previous history. Now look at the slope of that curve. It is much lower than that. Our time is running out, and I must yield back, but I will come to the floor again soon, and we'll spend quite some time looking at this chart, because you've got only one chart to look at where you were going to predict what you thought might happen in the future. I think this would be the chart, because you look back through history and see what has happened, and then you make a judgment. Wow. Are we going to find that much more oil in the future than we found back here, even with our increased capability to find oil? Yeah, we're going to find more, and we're going to pump more. But I think there is little or no chance that we'll be able to produce that oil fast enough to meet the growing demands of the world. You know, I love challenges. This is a huge challenge. And I think that facing this challenge, we can produce more jobs. We can be an exporter of the technologies for green energy. You know, I just feel challenged by this.